Welcome everybody to our first Hour of Power Zoom in this series for pastors, church leaders, parents, community leaders. We're just so excited to have you guys join us. Uh, for those of you who um, just getting to know Explicit Movement, we're just really here to help all of you to have these conversations about sexuality and sex with to have these conversations with confidence when you're trying to mentor young people and other people in your lives um, such a great opportunity to get equipped um, so you can have these conversations with confidence and really um, really impart uh, hope and healing to people and education and what I really love about tonight, as well as our up, up and coming events, is that um, you as, as adults, you know, as you're empowered, you can help navigate and uh, uh, young people and others to avoid hurtful and damaging experiences and instead really prepare people for healthy, thriving relationships according to God's design. So they we're all in process and, and I was so excited for you to join us. I want to, um, before, without further ado, I want to just in, introduce Vern Lam and Shante Williams. They're dear friends of mine, but also they're just powerful women who are just fighting the good fight against sex trafficking. And uh, they have, they are a wealth of, of wisdom, insights, health, and they're here to educate us and empower us with just great knowledge as, as well as great help. So without further ado, Vernon Shante. Ah, thank you. Thank you. I'll start getting our um, presentation ready. If Shante, you wanna say anything. Well, thank you for everybody who's joining tonight. We're gonna go through um, a basic PowerPoint we're going to show a video, not sure if you may have seen it, you may not have, but it's just going to kind of get you acclimated into the topic that we're going to talk about tonight. Then we're going to go into specifics on how it relates to COVID and different things that we have been seeing. And finally, we're going to end with an um, interactive conversation with you so that you can get to ask questions. We can kind of delve a little deeper and um, we'll go from there. Yes, awesome. and um, I just want to also say that we do have a chat. So if you want to chat questions, you know, try to pay attention and see, we can have a Q&A time later. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, Shante. So um, Shante, you want to talk a little bit? We thought that we would start with introducing ourselves. Yes, because we usually pass this part and we need to do better. So um, I'm... Shante Williams, Dr. Williams, everybody calls me Shante. Um, I have a clinical psych degree um, in, in um, clinical psych, but my dissertation was on domestic minor sex trafficking, which is commonly called commercial sexual exploitation of children now or child sex trafficking. From there, I started working with um, the Susanna Wesley Community Center where I'm currently the clinical program administrator. So I oversee our intensive case management program and our outpatient treatment program. And I've worked with various uh, populations. Um, I'm really driven to those who are traumatized, deeply traumatized. And so you will hear that kind of theme. We're always going through, we always intertwine evidence-based and experience-based um, uh, modalities and, and information when we're going through our presentations, because we try to get you as well-rounded and as trained up as we possibly can in the time that we're allowed. So we offer various different services at Susanna Wesley, like individual therapy, like I said, but also psychoeducation for parents, which is really helpful for people whose children are determined to be high risk or sexually trafficked. And so if you are somebody you know falls into that category, it's a really good group where it's people who are in the same boat, so there's no shame, and you're able to talk it out and understand why was your child chosen? Why are they acting the way that they've acted now that they've been identified? And it really just helps to um, add a cohesive, add some cohesion to the family that is disrupted by trafficking. So my name, uh, as uh, Michelle said, is Vern. That's what most people call me. Name is actually Veronica Lamb. Um, I've mentored over 100 human trafficking survivors, male, female, labor trafficking, sex trafficking, 
adults, kids, um, lived in and directed one of the only, um, well, at that time, it was one of the only trafficking safe homes on Oahu. And I'm the social justice director for Blue Water Mission. So that's a church here on Oahu. We have a um, outreach team also called Red Light Angels, which I know some of you on here have participated in either in the past or currently involved in. I'm also a victim specialist with Susanna Wesley Center. So like Shantae was saying, they provide that comprehensive case management to victims of human trafficking, particularly the children. Um, they cover them statewide. And then we also um, can use some other grants or, yeah, to the children statewide and then use other grants to provide services to adults here on Oahu. So that's just a little bit of our background so you guys know where we're coming from. And then before we get into it, um, we always start our presentations with this trigger warning. You know, obviously talking about trafficking is a difficult subject. As Shantae says, we um, weave in a lot about trauma in general and about abuse and how that affects the child. Uh, we really want you guys to come out well-rounded, but also want you to be prepared that this can always bring up memories. Memories of a time when something really hurtful happened to somebody that you loved, could have happened to yourself, that kind of stuff. So if you need to get up, take a break, you know, take a walk, get a drink of water, go to the bathroom, whatever it is that you need to do to give yourself a breather and some space, feel free to do that. And you can also, um, we have the chat, um, so I believe that you can private message, like if you wanted to private message um, explicit movement on there because she'll be able to monitor the chat while we go. If it's you want us to reach out to you or talk a little bit, um, we're happy to do that also. We don't want to leave anybody in that raw state. Anything else you want to say on that, Shantae? No. Okay. Um, you want to do today's agenda? So today's agenda, we're going to cover know the tactics recruiters are using. So what do you look out for when you are suspecting that somebody is trying to recruit your child or another child? Signs of a trafficking victim. So we really geared this towards parents and leaders. What are the things that you're going to look for? And then strategies for protecting your kids. So we're going to look at a video that Susanna Wesley Center um, prepared and it take me a second just to swap between this presentation and the video. But um, maybe Shantae you want to talk them through what to be thinking about when they start to watch this. Right. So this is called Through My Eyes and this is a day in the life of um, typical day in the life of our trafficking victims that we work with over at Susanna Wesley. We usually show this and have a very interactive conversation, but what we're going to do today is we're going to watch it kind of talk over to you important elements because sometimes people miss parts of the video. It does go a little fast and the nuances, the, the details um, are important because then we're going to go in to talk about the different types of like recruiters and we're going to tie it back into the video as much as we can so that you can get a sense of what it looks like in real life. So we're going to watch this. Um, again, this is a, like a day in the life through the eyes of our, reg our clients. So one of the first things that happens is the girl um, gets a text. Somebody, um, Tanya says, discussed it. Obviously, it's sad. Thank you. Um, it's so heart-wrenching from Corey. Uh, to know that that's happening here in Hawaii. I felt the same way, Corey. I grew up out here, and um, this is a true story. This happened at my alma mater, and when when I it was the very first call that I ever got that I went out for, and so it was really hard to digest because I don't know about you, but even with me doing my dissertation in my mind, this was a international problem. It did not happen here, and if it did, it was like some crazy ring that brought the kids over, but um, no, it's, it's commonly happening at the schools. And David said, this is much sneakier than I imagined. Yeah. So um, looking at the parts of the video, Alyssa, that was the friend on the text message, 
she's going to be what we call a recruiter. And so we're going to go into that in a minute. But her role, as you see, she said, um, he's mad. She was talking about a trafficker. So obviously, she's kind of like a go-between. Vern, you want to talk about some elements? Yeah, and I just saw that Tanya wrote in there that she used her sister as a threat or manipulation, obviously someone who knows her and the family. And that's a really good point because a lot of times the recruiters, I mean, once the trafficking starts, the recruiter is not a stranger. The recruiter has already built up relationship and even the trafficker isn't really um, a stranger. And yeah, yeah, Natasha, her recruiter is a school peer and we see that quite often. Yeah, Natasha, the, the recruiters are typically going to be the peer because it has to be somebody that is going to be able to get very close to a large group of kids without setting off alarms. So if you have an adult male that's hanging out with a lot of young girls, you're gonna, people are going to start noticing that, um, and they're not going to have such a big pool. And so we commonly see where recruiters are attending school most days out of none, um, out, out of out of all, and they very rarely miss. They're very active. They go into the victims that they are targeting homes. They get to know the families. That is very common. So when we think about recruitment um, specifically, there's a lot of different elements to it. One of the primary goals of the recruiter is these top two things: is building trust with the intention or with the goal of then isolating that chosen victim away from other relationships and away from other trusted people. So, you know, that can be just driving a wedge in relationships and that kind of stuff. Um, the recruiter also is involved as it escalates into the control of the victim. Uh, it could be the threatening of the victim and the playing of the mind games of like, well, this is your choice. Like, I asked you if you wanted to come out and hang with my friends. I asked you if you wanted to go to a party with me. That kind of stuff. They play those kinds of mind games. We also see where Corey said, I have a friend adopted, uh, whose adopted daughter was caught up in sex trafficking and is now in the mainland to break this cycle. And it's true, a lot of times we're having to relocate. Families are relocating or relocating the kids or, or sending them to treatment in the mainland because this is an island and it's so hard. And so with the recruitment, the reason why they're doing like the mind games and um, sleep depri deprivation, all of these types of things is to catch them to where their guards are off. But also while they're building trust, they're getting to know their habits, where they go, where they live, um, where they hang out. And so when they're trying to get out of this lifestyle, it's very scary for them because it can happen anywhere. There's a lot of threats, but as um, Natasha picked out, the threats aren't always obvious. Like they may, the trafficker or the recruiter may never do an outright threat of, I, I'm going to harm you. A lot of times it's very subtle, like how old is your sister? You know, like, oh, she's old enough, right? It's very subtle, but very impactful. And they're going to use those types of things. One of the things that I don't think we mentioned, we don't go into the human trafficking 101 because that is on, we did a, um, a conference a while back with Explicit and it's on the website. So if you haven't seen the 101 of like, we cover everything in depth, it was several hours, please go and check that out. So today we're just hitting certain elements. So if you feel like, a little bit lost that may be why and please feel free to ask questions if you want us to go into anything deeper yeah so i'll move over to the vulnerability so what is it that like a recruiter is looking for in a victim and specifically we're focusing tonight on children so we're talking about you know it would fall into that domestic sex trafficking we're talking about local kids what makes them vulnerable to being picked up by recruiters and traffickers here in Hawaii. So some of the key things that you see um, across the field, like across all victims of sex trafficking, is that we most often see sexual abuse in their background. Most of them were sexually abused as a child, and they often have additional early childhood abuse in there also. 
And part of what this is doing, and maybe Shantae, you want to talk about it a little bit more, but it's just, it's breaking, somebody else has already broken down the spirit of that child. Somebody has already taught them that um, love equals pain. And that makes it easier for the traffickers and easier for the recruiters to move in and do their manipulation. Yeah, so I think, Vern, you, you talked that you covered that really well. We show the research shows that between 93 and 97% of all traffic victims have a history of sexual abuse. So it's not saying that if a person was sexually abused that they're going to get into trafficking. It just is that precursor that makes it easier. And the pimps have a saying that a molestation is the boot camp to pimping because to them, they say, like Vern said, somebody has taught them that it's okay to cross your boundaries. It's okay to, when in that grooming process, when they want to tell the kid, um, you know, this is our secret. They might use teddy bears or gifts or candy. It's get telling, teaching them that they're going to get something in exchange for sex. So it's really blurring the lines for the children. And then in general, you have early childhood abuse. And one of the things that stood out to us that it surprised us, and I think it would surprise a lot of people, is that having an absent father, and that could be physically or emotionally, like it can be the family where the father is busy working multiple jobs to try and make ends meet for the family. It can be the father that is in the military and is getting deployed overseas and is gone for months at a time. That sort of gap there, a relational connection that the child may be feeling, a trafficker, a pimp is happy to step in and move, move into that position and play that role. We've also been really surprised here in Hawaii that large families seem to be more at risk for their youngest children to be trafficked. And we're not exactly sure why that is. That could be because, um, you know, by the time the parents have had all these children, they're older, um, they're tired, they might not be running around with the younger ones as much as possible. The older children may actually have some of the responsibilities of watching the younger children. And, you know, they're not fully adult, so they don't always have all the protective ideas and habits that maybe the parents um, would have if they were there in person all the time, 24 seven with the kids. But it's just something that we've really noticed as a trend. Um, some other ones, I'll just go down this column a bit more, is just that deep longing for love and acceptance. Like that's something that all of us have, right? Like we were created by God with this longing to be in community, to be in connection and to be loved um, and connected with people around us. And if children are in a position where they're not getting those needs met, that can also make them more vulnerable. Um, being in love with a pimp, so they don't know that it's a pimp that they're falling in love with. Um, they just think that it's the love of their life and it's somebody that treats them really nice in the beginning. Um, children that have little or no education um, that can also be a red flag. And like I said earlier, the military family, because it's often one or both of the parents that are getting deployed overseas. And I wanted to add with the military families, we're also seeing because of the race, right? So the pimps are going to want they what they call the people under them. So a group of girls or the group of boys or transgender, they call that a stable. And so in their stable, they want to be able to make the most money possible. And so they're going to want a Caucasian girl, a black girl, uh, um, Asian, and it's easier for them to get races outside of, they, they want the Hawaiian, every type, but they're going to look on the military basis because you can get the white, the black, the um, Puerto Rican, whatever you need on the military base. And then very closely on the military base, you can still get the Hawaiian families or very closely outside. So even those schools that are in close proximity to the military bases, we're seeing an increase of trafficking just because the pimps, it's, it's a one-stop shop. It's just easier for them to get that mixture um, for those type of, of kids. So um, then the next thing is proximity to prostitution and it's interesting, we will go into some of the schools and we're doing prevention in the schools and a lot of the kids will say, oh yeah, that's happening in my neighborhood. And what we're finding is it's game rooms where it's happening that the presence of prostitution, it begins to normalize 
for the kids. And they, they will see it. And at first, they're really shocked and they, like, stare and they gawk at what's happening. And then day after day, it becomes more normalized for them. And so you tend to start to wear the, 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 the victims down or their recruiters by talking to them daily, offering them at nice things. And they will often see, like, in their neighborhoods, they will go to the poor neighborhoods and have these nice cars and offer a lot of money and get the kids. But we've also seen on the flip side that we're going to talk about it a little bit, um, how COVID has changed the proximity of prostitution in the neighborhoods in Hawaii. We're going to go into that. Um, the other thing that you will see that the vulnerabilities for these kids are having a low self-esteem, uh, a lack of a support system, poor attachment, family dysfunction, and mentally challenged. So basically, if you look at the list, any child at a different time likely is going to fall within these categories. Like deep longing for love and acceptance, like Vern said, is a common feeling that humans, emotion that humans are going to have. And so it's hitting them at the right time. And these guys, because they make a lot of money, every victim standard across the United States of America is required to bring in a quota, which is a minimum amount of a thousand dollars a night. And so they spend a lot of time learning their trade, learning it well, and learning how to see these subtleties in kids, in, in, in vulnerable people, and then they're going to go and they're going to move on it. Um, so talking more about the victim profile. So as we're saying, anyone can be a victim of trafficking. It's not like it's just one social economic um, class of people. It's not just... Uh, you know, particular races, like they're looking for everybody, they're looking for a wide variety, okay? But we wanted to highlight those that are higher risk uh, for trafficking. So females and those that identify LGBTQ, um, and also youth in middle and high school age groups. So the average age of entry from what we've seen is 12 years old. And certainly being an ethnic minority increases their risk. And also for youth that have older boyfriends or girlfriends. So they're already like dating and having interactions with those that are outside of their typical age group. That makes it easier then for older ones to come in and influence them and bring them around other different players there. And certainly youth with little or no familial or social support. Right? If you don't have safe, protective people looking out for you, it's easier then for somebody who's a predator to swoop in and start that relationship, start that interaction and drawing you away from what's healthy. What's important to know, like Vern said in the beginning, that it can be anyone. This is who their number one targets are going to be. They are going to spend the majority of their times in the middle schools and the high schools looking for these kids online, whatever. But we, it doesn't matter. With we've worked at Susanna Wesley, the youngest victims that we have ever served are two years old. That were confirmed trafficked, and the oldest were, um, and well, two years old we didn't work with. I'm sorry, two years old that we identified, but we didn't work with. Six years old that we worked with, and the oldest was 68 that had just been recruited in um, within months of us meeting her. So it's it's a wide spectrum of victim. Anybody can fall prey because they, they're opportunistic, but what they're really going to look for are, is the group right here on the profile. Okay, so let's talk about like signs of a trafficking victim. And I also just wanted to say, you know, if you have ideas, if you have questions, if you're like shocked by things, you want to type those in the chat, like feel free because that's also some things that we can come back to as we're presenting or at the end when we do question and answer. So signs of a traffic victim. How do you recognize when somebody might be trafficked? Um, some of the things that you wanna look for is like sleeping a lot during the day. And I want to highlight that this can be for one of two reasons. It can be because they are up a lot at night because they're actually working. And so therefore they need to sleep during the day to catch up. Or it could be that they're sleeping a lot during the day because maybe they're they may have just gotten out of it or they've got some nights off, that kind of thing, but they frequently have nightmares 
and um, anxiety and insomnia and things that keep them from sleeping at night. So it could be either one of those. Um, and then also abusing substances. You know, I think, I think a lot of people, even in the Christian community, can identify with when we have a bad day, it is not unusual for people to want to come home, you know, or end their day with some sort of comfort. And that can be a drink of wine, that can be a beer, um, that can be uh, sweet foods. I mean, it can be anything, right? Like it can be anything that we want to numb ourselves with. And most of us on this call, I'm going to assume, did not have anywhere near the kind of day that a trafficking victim had today, right? And so obviously they want to numb, they want to forget, they want to drown out those memories and not think about it. And so you often see abusing substances as part of the um, self-medicating process of dealing with trauma. I wanted to um, add on to what the abusing substances a lot of times, depending on how you were raised, what type of environment you grew up in, you may not know what it looks like. You may not know what it smells like. You may not see it. And so if you observe anything in your child or another child or person that you're not sure what you're seeing, but there's something to it, Google it. That is very helpful. So if you, because one of the things that, like for marijuana, for example, it used to be very easy to catch a child that's smoking marijuana because it has a pungent smell. Now, we've had people who say, I smell this weird incense, and they didn't know what it was, but they knew there was a smell. Now they have what they call dab, which is a liquid form of marijuana that has no scent. So other than the smoke that you can see coming out of that person's mouth, you would not know. A kid, many kids go into the bathroom, go into their bedrooms. It looks like an e-cigarette and they are smoking marijuana and it's at a very high grade, a very high potency. And so what you're gonna see though, is that you've gotta look for the redness of the eyes and they're very smart. They put visine in their eyes a lot. So you wanna see, are they carrying eye drops or something like that? And then an increase in appetite and lethargy. So you have to like start looking at the symptoms that you're seeing. Are they up all night? Are they dropping significant weight? You look at that and then you may be able to see what kind of substances they're abusing. And then also pay attention to your own medicine cabinets. A lot of them start off by abusing their parents' um, med prescription meds. And then because those things are so potent, like oxycodone is the equivalency to heroin out there, they're making much larger swoops to the more serious drugs much quicker. Um, so other signs that you want to be noticing and looking for would be like depression, um, bruises and scars, so that unexplained um, injuries on them, and a change in style of dress. And I want to highlight that this can go either way. So they can be suffering from overwhelming feelings of um, shame and want to cover up. And so wearing baggy clothes and uh, wearing or wearing a sweatshirt all of the time, wearing long sleeves all of the time, always wearing long pants, that kind of stuff. That can be one way in which a victim goes, or you can see them go the other way where it's a very um, promiscuous, uh, very low amount of coverage of clothing, trying to get attention, looking overly sexualized, that kind of stuff. You can see victims go either direction there. So David asked, is it possible to just say no with any success? Uh, what is the life expectancy of a trafficking victim for the time that they are a victim? The life expectancy research says it's like about seven years, but in Hawaii, they it's a little bit different, I think. Like um, we've worked with some of them for a long space of time. It just depends on their trafficker, on if they're staying in Hawaii. A lot of times they will move them onto the mainland where it's a lot of rougher streets. So it just depends. As far as saying no, I do think there is, a big advantage to teaching your child to say no, because if the trafficker thinks, if the recruiter or the pimp thinks it's too hard, they will often just move on to the next kid, right? Like they want easy targets. They are looking for vulnerabilities. They can't, they understand that you cannot get every, just anybody to do that. Many pimps, they write books, they have videos out, there's YouTube videos where they're training each other, they're talking about it. 
and they will freely say, oh, you can't get a girl. If she has morals, then you know, don't waste your time. They're telling them you move on. So you definitely want to keep, teach your kid to say no. But the issue that comes up, we see more so, is it feeds into what Tanya said. It's the manipulation. So there's a lot of language that they use, and they really, they have step-by-step guides on how to break down a victim to get into sex trafficking. And so by the time this person, they're introducing this for some of them, it's the relationship has gone on for so long, they're so in love that they have a hard time saying no. And then there are pimps that are gorilla pimps, and that is a pimp that will beat or threaten um, somebody into submission, and they do use violence. So there's a spectrum, but you do have a very good chance of not if the child or the individual says no, um, knows how to get away and get out of those situations. So that's why prevention is really big. Yeah, absolutely. And self-confidence. Yeah. Um, uh, Shante, you want to do the secretive about phones and stuff? Yeah. So secretive about phones, laptops, and devices. What we see is sometimes the kids, like the parents will see, you're all, they're always like if they're talking to their friend, they might not just have it open. But if you notice that a kid is really guarded with their phone or their laptop, you want to pay attention. We've had many parents, they've caught their kids, they've literally caught um, people on the way to their homes, or they've caught them sending inappropriate pictures and various different things by noticing that their child was acting very secretive and picking up the phone. Um, the, the second thing is looking at dating apps on the phone. So they will have like um, Meet Me, Plenty of Fish, uh, Grindr, Tumblr, all of these apps that seeking arrangements that are dating apps, but they're really um, using it to do what they call dates. So trading sex in exchange for money on. And the pimps are also setting up dates on these dating apps. So you have to be very careful of what kind of language they're using, what type of questions they're asking, and how they're answering those questions. But there's also sites like Kick, TikTok, Snapchat. Um, there's one called Omegle that is like meet strangers in your neighborhood. And if you're on it, it will literally show where you are compared to this stranger, how far you guys are, and if you could meet up with the understanding that it's usually a sexual meetup. So you really want to pay attention to the apps they have on the phone and utilize some kind of parent parental device because there is many different apps that can also hide other apps. So to be specific, there's like a calculator that if you as a parent pick up the phone and you check out the calculator, you add, it'll add, divide, whatever you need. But if your child puts in a specialized code that they've set, and they hit that code, it will open up a whole new screen with new apps, new pictures, everything on the same exact phone, and you will only know it if you know the code to the calculator. Uh, the now, name so of, repeat. I'm sorry. Yeah. Chanel asked to repeat the name of the apps. Yeah, so the name of the app, I think you're talking about the one to meet the neighbors, is Omegle, O-M-E-A-G-L-E, -E, I believe, Omegle. So yeah, you guys want to check out those. And I do want to give one caveat. Um, it, it could be a trafficker looking to meet up with your child. It could be a pervert looking to meet up with your child, right? It's not always guaranteed that everybody who wants to have sex with a teenager is a trafficker and is going to, um, going to sell them. But it's a very common method in which both what I call the perverts and the traffickers, they both use similar methods. And so you gotta watch out for both and look out for them. Um, other things that we wanna just highlight on here as far as signs of a trafficking victim, unexplained new items. So what that is, is like, you know, maybe like fancy things that are standing out to you, like that you don't know how your kid got, or it's a kid in your youth group or something like that. You don't understand how that kid, it doesn't make sense, how they would have gotten that expensive item, whatever it is. And it can be, you know, new shoes, it can be um, a new phone, like an expensive phone, it can be bags, it can be um, uh, really anything, you know what I, and it's, it's a sign that they're being groomed by somebody else. Somebody is trying to give them expensive things to buy basically their favor. 
and by their relationship. And so that's what you want to be concerned about there. And then um, change in mood and a change of friends. So pay attention to your gut instincts. Do you notice that your child is off? Do you notice that your child is different? Do you notice that um, who they're hanging out with, like you've got a different gut instinct about these, these friends. And you wanna really pay attention to that and, and ask questions and be involved. And um, yeah, ask those things. All right, trafficking during COVID. So specific changes. Those other things are like trends that we've seen, unfortunately, for years here in Hawaii. Um, so looking at COVID, we really started noticing some differences. One of the things that we're noticing is on around the homeless um, encampments. And this is a quote actually from a customer. And, uh, you know, Shante and I unfortunately have the knowledge of where to go to find out what customers are saying um, about the uh, victims that they're having sex with, uh, about those, you know, just customers of prostitution, where they're looking and what they're saying and things. So this is one of the quotes from one of the customers here in Hawaii uh, recently. He said, Jesus, I'm seeing so many homeless women now, thanks to Rona, so coronavirus. Um, if you're a single monger, so that means like a single person who um, is a customer looking for prostitutes, with your own spot, so basically having your own place to live, and a bit of money, this is a golden age. Good luck, be kind, and be careful, gentlemen. So just highlighting like, hey, this is amazing time for us to take advantage of people without money or people um, that are homeless. Um, the other one is massage parlors in communities. So this is what we were talking about earlier with the proximity um, to prostitution. That is going to increase the likelihood that your child or children or individuals, young adults, older adults are going to be recruited or exposed to this type of lifestyle. And prior, you know, the massage parlors, you can see they're downtown. Everybody knows they have the red lights, um, bars on the windows and everything like that. But on this same site, we didn't do the cut and paste, but they were talking about, and you can also see on the news, they've had several reports of uh, massage parlors that are in homes, like within the regular community. So for example, on the site, they were talking specifically about this home in IAEA. That's a new home that has a massage parlor, and they were giving tips of like, don't go and park in the garage because you don't, what well, you don't want the neighbors. The neighbors must be wondering by now how many, how come so many guys are going in there? And if you don't want to call attention to yourself, just kind of park on the side of the street and watch until the street is looks a little bit clear and walk in and they're saying how they like it because it's so much easier than going to a parlor with this big flashing light and everybody knows what you're doing they also talked about how it's easier to go for jobs and you're um at nighttime with your when your family is at home after dinner and they could think that you're going for a run and instead you can go to these massage parlors so that's one of the increases another one of the increases that we're seeing during covid is massage parlors within communities, within the neighborhood. Then I think everybody knows this, is that in general, there's increased social media and internet use of everybody, but also of children, right? Um, teenagers and everybody is online more. Um, Shante, you had some sort of uh, stat that you threw out the other day when we were talking about it, like 10 times the amount. I don't remember. I okay. probably read it that day. Sorry. <laughs> I don't want to give false information, but yeah, yeah. it's, 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 um, I probably saw it on the news. I can't remember. Sorry, but it is an extreme amount of, um, kids have really increased their use of social media and the internet. And even the parents who are usually very hypervigilant can't be anymore because we're working, you know, we're doing our own thing. We're on the computer ourselves. And then this, the kids have to be, on the computer to do and have internet access in order to work at, for doing schoolwork at this time. So it's really caused um, an increase in victimizations via um, social media. And then we have all this un increased unsupervised time where if the parents are out of the house and the kids are old enough, they are home 
doing whatever, and these predators know it. They are not afraid to go to your house and meet your kid when you are not there. They are not afraid to ask for videos. They're not afraid to ask for pictures. And it is really alarming to me the amount of calls that we get when we go out and we talk to a kid and they have been exchanging um, nude pictures or uh, inappropriate videos, uh, nude videos or videos of them doing things with themselves that when we ask them, how long was this conversation before it began? It is within hours to days before they are sending news from meeting this person. And these are kids that never did anything like that before. So really educating your kids, monitoring them is really important. And I think part of what you want to do is like you, you want to open up conversation. We'll talk about that a little bit later about conversations with teenagers and making it comfortable. Um, so victims and PPE, the, the personal protective um, equipment. So we've heard from victims that are in massage parlors, like regular ones, and they said that it was business as usual. They were operating, um, just going on. Customers were coming in. That was during the whole like COVID season. Um, they said that sometimes they would try and use like a fa face mask or something like that, but the customers are not. And so there's also an increased risk of um, COVID spreading throughout um, the sex industry here in Hawaii. And thank you, Melody. Melody, I think you're the Melody Stone from Big Island. Hi, good to see you. Uh, she's shared, uh, thank you for the stat. It, shared Hope International said online grooming has increased 800% in the past two years and even more since COVID. So now we have a couple of um, screenshots for you guys and we clipped out some things um, there, uh, but you can see some quotes from some of the customers that are posting and giving advice to each other. Like this was very early on where they were talking about how downtown is like a ghost town and that they guess even the sex workers are being cautious and telling the other mongers, so those are customers, um, that it will pass, but not anytime soon. So somebody else was suggesting an online porn site and how that was offering free um, premium subscriptions right now. And um, that there probably aren't any sex workers out on the street. Again, this was very early in COVID and uh, wondering if there's any escorts or massage parlors still working. So they were not scared about this virus. They were still out there and trying to figure out, you know, how can they find um, uh, victims to interact with. Then we this, this one, uh, okay. Go you ahead. know what, Shantae, go for it. Okay, this one we had, um, we were looking and they were asking us, has COVID stopped, has COVID slowed down the work. And so Vern and I were looking through these things and we found this one. So what you see at the top is a link to a person's ad where they're going to be selling, they're going to have a picture of themselves selling um, sex in exchange for money. And it's going to say how much they're going to charge. Usually it's a trafficker that's going to post this picture of the victim. And her name was um, Big Booty, Big Boute. And they said, does anybody have info on this Latin girl? And so this guy says, if I'm going to make my family sick and dying by hooking up with escorts, I hope the person is this hot and in shape. So I think it goes to show how serious this is where these buyers understand that they are putting their family at risk. And it's not that they can stop, but they're just saying, I hope that they look this good in case I kill myself and my family. I think that's important, you know, because we get sometimes people saying like, oh, this isn't a big deal. Like this is consensual that even for the kids, they'll talk about how, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Like the older teenagers just want a place to live or they want an older boyfriend or this kind of stuff. And I think it's important to show that the customers are, it's not just the traffickers that are the problems, the, tra the customers are the problems also. And sometimes the customers um, are just as dangerous or more dangerous than even the traffickers themselves. You know, we have had women out here in Hawaii that have been killed by customers. And so it's important, I think, for us to show that um, it's not a victimless crime. And there's a lot of, um, at a minimum, I would guess say lack of empathy and lack of um, appropriate concern for the health and welfare of everyone around them, these customers that are stuck in the sexual addiction. 
And Tanya is saying, this is why this is important and we got to pray. And that is absolutely correct because I think a lot of times when you're dealing with this, you start to feel so helpless or hopeless or, and things like that. And you've always got to pray to do this type of work. You got to stay prayed up so that you can go back in it. It's a lot of darkness, a lot of spiritual warfare, but it can be prevented and it can be stopped. We've just got to work through it. And with the grace of God, we can do this. Um, Speaking of prevention, we wanted to talk about how do you prevent the vulnerabilities in the recruitment, right? So how do you get your kid built up or a person built up to where they're just not approachable? Uh, and the first thing is to prevent abuse. A lot of times you will see, it's I think a lot of, it's the economy of Hawaii. It's so expensive that we have multi-generations in a family home. Yet, so what that leads to a lot of times is multi-generational abuse. You will have grandpa who has abused his kids and um, their kids and great grandkids that is still in the home and still having access. And where we find in Hawaii, the culture a lot of times says what happens in the family stays in the family. And that's being, that's hurting a lot of the kids because it's not fair. It's telling them that they cannot talk and they cannot tell people when they're abused. So we have to stop that and we have to speak out against it and if you see signs of abuse you tell you intervene you report it and you stop it and you help the person because that is one of the precursors remember 93 to 97 percent are going to have that type of abuse in their background and then preventing sexualization and so I, to me what this means you know is is not making or helping children to not feel like what the most important thing about them is their sexuality, is if they're in a sexual relationship with somebody else, if they're viewed as sexy, you know, if they're viewed as attractive and those kinds of things. And so you want to, and I'm sure a lot of you guys do that already, is just try and prevent, um, yeah, that sexualization of the children where they feel like that their value or when they grow up, how their value is determined is whether or not they are in a relationship and what kind of relationship that is. Okay. Michelle is saying that we have 10 minutes left. Um, if we, so I think, that. yeah. So I think that we, we're almost at the end, Vern, are we with? I think so, this is our last slide, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Um, so with the, the slide before was just talking about therapy, and I do, if you are working with the population and they are engaging in therapy, you want to make sure the person is qualified and has a background in working with victims. You can reach out to us. Um, we even have manualized treatments that we have created and one for individualized that's in the works with uh, Dr. Rhodes and I, because we've learned that the you, you can't treat uh, a, tra a traffic victim like a regular trauma victim. There's just many layers and many um, nuances in the language that make things different. And so you want to make sure that you're not reinforcing something that this trafficker has taught them or said. Yeah. And then here, this was a five point plan that we made um, for Michelle. And this is in that um, listen event. That's the thing that's online that Michelle put in here in the chat. Um, it's on the website at explicitmovement.org. It's called Listen, and it's under the free resources is the audio. But you can hear us talk more about that. Um, but we just basically put together some basic steps for individuals on how to keep their youth safe. Um, but we can transition over to Q&A now. If people want to talk about that or ask any questions, pop it into the chat. Or we can Michelle. even go on video if they want now, too. Yeah, I can stop sharing my screen here. But one of the things that we did say we were going to double back on is with talking to your kids. And I think it's important for us to be very clear that, you know, it's hard when you have these types of conversations and trainings. You want to get off and like, oh, my gosh, don't do this and don't do that. But you know that kids, you got to remember how you were at that age and what you could hear and what you couldn't hear um, when speaking with adults. And a lot of times it's in the way. And so making it a very comfortable, open dialogue, usually we find goes a long way where you give them the space to ask questions and don't freak out if they ask questions that make you uncomfortable. 
but just to answer it and even to like share with them like, oh man, I'm struggling to answer that. But you know, they can see that you're being authentic. And I think it really will go a long way and help to keep them safe. Yeah, and I think, you know, a lot of parents question um, how early they should start conversations. And that's something that I think every family has to talk about like individually. But for me, it was really important that my children understood like one correct body anatomy and that they would be able to communicate if anything did happen and that they were able to understand what was safe touch areas, not safe touch areas. I mean, pretty much nobody should really be touching them. Um, you know, we just kind of went through it and it was a conversation that we revisited and we started those conversations, um, you know, just over the two year old mark, three year old mark, um, because we wanted them to be aware and able to describe anything that was happening. And they were also able and giving them permission to be able to say no or to be able to say something's not right or talking them through safe um, people to disclose to. And so even, you know, my kids are now seven years old and three years old and we just revisited that conversation again with our seven year old. And so anyway, that's how I've handled it in my family. And then we've got some questions popping up now. Yeah, so David said, in California, we have what our state government has mandated in our government schools, K through 12, called comprehensive sex education. CSE utilizes porn and sexual deviancy training. Doesn't this play right into sex trafficking? I have seen reports and hoped that those were false on what CSC is teaching. If it's the one that I'm thinking of, I do find it concerning where it was teaching like four-year-olds how to masturbate and different things like that. And so just being a parent, you want to always check what they're teaching your kids from history to math, especially the sex education, and the best teacher is yourself. So unfortunately for a lot of kids, they don't have that. And I am definitely an advocate for health and them teaching appropriate like you know ministration and different things like that and appropriate sexual topics because we have found that the majority of the kids who were being molested didn't know they were being molested until they had health class in the seventh grade and that's because they grew up with it and nobody told them that it was wrong and not until they found out in health that that's not what happened in everybody's family were they able to come forward and get help so you just want to make sure that it isn't teaching them anything that you find totally against your morals or that is going to be sexualizing kids too early and, and um, exposing them to pornography because pornography is the gateway into sex trafficking. And I do want to say one thing. I have a, um, or a couple years ago, I had a foster youth staying with me that was in middle school and um, he came home and was frustrated that at middle school, and it's pretty good. I mean, it's not, maybe not the best middle school, but it was public middle school. It's pretty good. It's not uh, in a terrible area. And he was so frustrated because he said, all, all the kids do is just look at porn on lunch break and any break between classes and after school. So everybody's on their phones and showing different porn. And that was here in Hawaii at a middle school two years ago. Sorry, Michelle, I think I cut you off. You were gonna say something? Oh yeah, I was just gonna say that um, I actually saw for myself in Canada, they had these set of books, like you know um, how you teach first graders how to read, so you have these readers. And it was, I saw them and I read them, they were like a four, four or so in a series and they were being used in school systems and it was, the topic was uh, how to masturbate and wh wh why to masturbate and why it's good to masturbate and the, the, the characters that were in the, were masturbating, it was shocking to me, but this is what some of the radical kinds of curriculum is out there in public schools, at least I know in Canada. Um, so yes, I think the kids are getting sexualized at a young age, if that's true, you know, these curriculums out there. Yeah, I would not be a fan of that. Um, <laughs> so, um, Tanya said, I was wondering if anybody could lead me to any resources specifically for special needs students on this issue. I think someone told me, but I forgot. I honestly, I don't know, maybe Shantae can think of one, but I don't know of anything that's specific to sex trafficking. I would maybe start off with sexual abuse because the um, 
special needs students, uh, mentally and physically um, disabled students are uh, at higher risk for being abused, um, any kind of abuse, certainly sexual abuse, and then also trafficking. Do you have anything else, Shantae, you can think of? No, I would, I would um, reach out about the regular curriculum and just if you need to translate it into more age appropriate for them so that wherever their level of learning is, because definitely they still need to have the training. Um, Vern and I have worked with mentally and physically disabled individuals that were trafficked. Um, it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much, Shantae and Vern. It's, it's eight o'clock and we just, I'm so grateful to both of you for sharing so much wealth of great information and empowering all of us. Um, I do wanna remind people that if you wanna do the 101 <laughs> course in this, which is a great foundation, uh, Shantae and Vern laid, um, you can go to our website, explicitmovement.org in the free resource tab, and you can uh, just watch, listen to the conference as well as we have that handout. You can you can download um, like, a, like a very good hand, handy reference for you regarding this subject. Thank you all for joining us. I know you're here because you care and there's hope because together we can make a difference. And thank you so much, Shantae and Vern.